Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we are focused on giving hope and strength to the entire military community. Whether you're a veteran, active duty, guard, reserve, or a family member, this podcast will share inspirational stories and resources that are useful to you. I'm your host, Scott Lucio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to Drive On. I'm your host, Scott Deluzio, and today my guest is Chris Owens, the Executive Director of the Restored Valor Project. And today we'll explore how uh, he and the, the Restored Valor Project aims to directly tackle the mental health crisis among veterans and the approach to resolving these conditions, uh, you know, beyond just alleviating the symptoms that go along with some of these these uh, conditions. So before we get into all of that and everything else that, that Chris is into, um, Chris, welcome to the show. Really glad to have you here. Thank you. Really, really happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so Chris, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your background and kind of what got you into doing what you're doing now. Um, I know before we started talking, you you said, you know, you have you have quite an extensive background and um, I'd love to know a little bit more about that and, and kind of where you're coming from with your your approach and, um, you know, how you got into what you're doing now. Okay, sure. Um, well, in order to get into how I started in all this, I think there's a little bit of context I have to give about where this type of counseling even comes from. Okay. Um, I don't know if you looked much into it prior to, the, prior to this call, but um, so it's called Dianetics. And Dianetics was originally a book written in 1950 by L. Ron Hubbard. Okay, it was called Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. Now, some people will recognize that name, L. Ron Hubbard, because he's the man who later founded Scientology. Okay. okay. The thing that I always like to point out on this is that it doesn't matter what somebody's religious beliefs are, spiritual beliefs in relation to Dianetics. Dianetics came first, and it's just a mental science. And what it basically does is it explains exactly where and how pain is stored in the mind and then how it gets reactivated later to cause the variety of mental difficulties that people experience in life. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the reason I mentioned that is because when I was, when I was 17 years old, I was very interested in being a psychologist. I was in high school and I managed to, I, I don't know if you, I'm not sure how old you are. Um, like I'm 47. So I don't know if you remember the commercials years ago, it used to be on TV for Dianetics. It was the, com that the volcano went read Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. It was this whole, it, these commercials okay. were on all the time, but they were just, they were real quick. And I had no idea what the hell it was until I saw an infomercial one Sunday morning. And the infomercial was like 30 minutes and explained, oh, it's like, oh, okay, that's what it is. That's kind of up my alley. I want to know what that is. So I went to the store that day and I bought the book and I started reading it. And um, maybe, you know, I sent a card in for more information and they called me the organization in, in Philly, which is where I'm near and uh, invited me down to check out more and everything. And, uh, and it was a Scientology organization, but that's where they did they had, uh, all these various courses, right? And Dianetics and stuff like that. And my main interest was I wanted to learn how to do that. I wanted to know how to help people using this stuff and that day i literally uh got signed up for it and so like at 17 years old i got professionally trained on how to handle all this stuff <laughs> okay which is very unusual <laughs> for a 17 year old to do that um i ended up working i ended up joining staff and working at that organization for about 18 years uh doing a variety of, of things but um but dianetics was always part of um, was always my love, um, because it, it's, it's really, it's quite fascinating, but that's why, that's where I originally got trained in this, right? But I've been doing it, uh, all this time. Um, not only did it do the professional training at that time, I then redid the professional training later when it got updated and improved upon. So I did that again. Um, but that's, that's where it comes from. That's where I started to, uh, get trained in this. Okay. So, uh from a very young age, uh, you, you know, so a lot of times high school age kids, you ask them, you know, what do they want to do? And it's like, ah, gee, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm still in high school. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a kid and I, I want to be a kid for a little bit longer, right? And hang on to that while, while the last couple of years are, 
are uh, fading away before you know going off to college or wherever else uh, life takes them after after high school but it seemed like you pretty much knew from a pretty early age what what it was that you wanted to do and um it, you know you, you shot right out and you you found ways to do that and um you know got the training and and did all the the legwork up front and uh you know that that's pretty awesome um because it, it's not often that you hear someone it's like i i know exactly what i want to want to do and 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 all that because people sometimes they they change things around and they they learn as they grow like ah no that's not for me but you know you you had it you know from a pretty early age but um so tell us yep. a little bit more about the the work that you do um you know through this type of uh type of therapies okay well First of all, let me give you a real simple definition for Dianetics. Yeah. Um, well, the origin of the word comes from dia, uh, Greek, uh, which is for like mind and nous. I'm sorry, dia is through, nous is mind. Okay? okay, so it literally means through the mind, right? But what Dianetics is, is a, it's a one-on-one -on -one therapy technique that allows a person to permanently release pain out of a memory. Okay? Okay. And... That statement, just even that definition there, and what I'm saying it can do, is something that even modern psychology cannot do, and even does not even try to advertise and doesn't even try to claim they can do generally. It, it, the mental health industry, and this cut, this kind of gets into, you know, very much with the situation with veterans. You know, if you look at any professional industry. Let's let's take another one. Let's take um, um, auto mechanic. Okay. Now, if your car was making a loud noise and you brought it to your local mechanic, and he spent fifteen minutes on it, and he goes, uh, "Yeah, yeah, looks like your car has sputter disorder." <laughs> now, here's what I need you to do. I want you to bring your car back to me once a week. Um, there's no guarantee how long you might, this may be months or years. You might be bringing your car back to me. I'm, I'll spend a little time on it. In the meantime, take these. What are those? Oh, the, those are earplugs. You put those in, you won't hear it as much while we're working on the car, right? Like, it, like during all these years and stuff of working on it, you know, if the car doesn't get better, maybe it didn't want to get better. It's possible, you know? So, but, but if that was how, if that was your experience with the mechanic, you said, this guy's a quack. I'm not going to this guy. I'm leaving. Find a real mechanic. Yeah. Right. But what if that was the standard what if that was the world of mechanics after a while you wouldn't even notice it being weird <laughs> you would just know that cars are hard to understand they're hard to solve and maybe one day after more billions are, are of research are invested someone will figure out how to make cars work better but that's the situation in mental health people sure. don't even they don't even see how ridiculous it is why can't you go and just get fixed up? It's like even me suggesting that to some people is offensive, right? How can you say that? It's such a, you, you know, you can never get rid of these things. They're just, I have to live with them forever. And they're, that's the mindset that we've gone into because this profession is so inept, right? And then on top of it, because the counseling doesn't work very well, people go to an alternative, which they would prefer not to but they think is the only thing left, which is the drugs, mm -hmm. right? And the psychiatric drugs. I'll take this, I'll take that kind of thing. I mean, when we talk about, you know, what's the most significant thing that's always talked about when it comes to veterans is the suicide rate, right? Sure. 22 sure. people a day. Well, the thing is, is that if you really look into that, you know, trauma by itself does not typically cause suicide. But you know what does? You know what's in the side effects of every one of those psych drugs? Suicidal ideation. Yeah. Right? I, that that actually was astounding to me because I did a little bit of research in, in some of the medications that get prescribed. And I, I saw that suicidal ideation was like very common amongst most of the ones that I, I looked at. And I, I was like, how the hell are you going to prescribe something like that to someone who already is, you know, maybe depressed or, you know, having other you know, mental health yeah. issues? Like, wouldn't that just push them over the edge, you know? Yeah. And, and not only that, it, it's not it's not even that the drug just pushes them over the edge. 
the drug can cause suicidal ideation in someone who has n no other thing. Like they were nowhere near that before. Yeah. It can cause them to start feeling that way. So it's not even like it's, it just takes a bad situation and makes it a little worse. No, it can completely generate it out of nothing. Right. Hmm. And so we're looking at this and we're saying, you know, we say, oh, the veterans, we have to help them. We have to help them. We have to help them to solve the suicide rate. And everyone focuses on the trauma, which does need to be helped. But they don't realize that there's it's like there's the original problem and then there's the extra problem that was created on top of it by the psychiatric industry that makes it far worse. Hmm. And so the one thing I'd say is when you do Dionysus counseling, like we never we never do the Dionysus counseling on someone on one of those drugs. They have to first find a way to safely come off them sure. because you don't know what that drug's doing to them. You know, if you take a look at and you took antidepressant drugs, they have a side effect, which is depression. Mm -hmm. Anti-anxiety drugs have a side effect, which is anxiety. So if they're taking the drug, how much is the drug and how much is the original condition? Right. Some people, they had a problem in their, just in their, in their present time environment. They go on the medication, the environment changes, but now they're still in the medicine. If they were off the medicine, they might find the, anx the anxiety is not there because it was, a, it was a present time situation that was causing mm -hmm. it in that case. Yeah, right. Anyway. It, no, and, and all of that makes sense too, because it, just think about, um, go back to high school science classes and you, you learn, like apply one variable at a time to something as you're testing your whatever your hypothesis happens to be. And, and it, you know, as you, you're, you're going through, you want to make sure that that one change is the thing that's causing this as opposed to, Hey, let's just go throw a whole bunch of stuff together and see what happens. And, Oh yeah, it must've been because we added that one thing. Well, you added, you know, five other things to, to the equation. And now uh, how could you say with any uh, certainty that that one thing was the thing that caused it? You know, it, it could have, it could have been a combination of things. It could have been, you know, whatever, but, but to your point, if, if you're working with someone who is on one of these medications, um, you don't know how that medication is affecting them. And it's like, at, at the end of the day, we want to address the root cause of the problem and not the symptoms that are caused by the medication. So eliminate that one variable. And now you just have the the person that you're trying to treat and not trying to treat the medication that the person is, is taking as well. Right. And so that, yeah. I, I think that does make sense to kind of eliminate some of those var variables in the, the equation. Right. Yeah. And not only that, but um, some of these drugs have really weird, like long-term effects that mm -hmm. can even affect the person after they get, after they get off the drug. Um, if you ever get a chance, look up the, can um, some of the, you'll see like there are groups about akathisia and tardive dyskinesia. Have you ever heard of those? I have not, no. So akathisia is like an intense restlessness that you just can't satiate. Okay. Um, it can cause a person to like, you know, like they might pace back and forth, but they're doing that because they just can't. It's like, it's like a, imagine like when you were your most anxious you ever were. Now, now take the emotion away and just leave that physical tension. Mm. And then, but have it be persistent where you can't get rid of it. Okay. And so uh, you're just uh, constantly maybe fidgeting or, or pacing or, or things like that just over and over. Well, the, right? Yeah. The fidgeting and pacing is more their coping measure for the feeling they have. Okay. Right? It's not that the drug causes that. Now there's the other condition, tardive dyskinesia is one that causes actual tics or mo involuntary movements. Um, you may have seen commercials now where they, they say, talk about TD or ask your doctor, do you have tardive dyskinesia? The commercials are so misleading because it makes it sound like it's actually an actual illness. It's not. It is purely and 100% only from antipsychotics, usually. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess other regular psych drugs maybe can cause it, but especially antipsychotics do it. But it's basically like if you were to go into a mental institution and you see someone and they were like twitching and they're like doing all kinds of stuff like that, that's not usually the psychosis that's causing those motions. That's the drug that they're using to treat the psychosis. It's causing that, right? And the problem is, is that they're on it long enough that can actually just remain permanent, mm -hmm. okay? Anyway, I don't wanna get stuck on the drugs too much, but the last sure. thing I wanted to say about it was that the whole idea of the medications is that they're all claimed on this idea of chemical imbalance. 
but there is no test. There's no medical test that any doctor can do anywhere in the world that can prove that where you could line up 10 people, do this medical test and show that these six have a mental chemical imbalance and these four do not. It doesn't work like that because the test does not exist. Mm. It is purely a theory that was made up by the marketing departments of, of psych psychiatric and pharmaceutical companies. And not only isn't there a test, but if you were to scour psychiatric textbooks, you would find that there's not even anywhere that says what the correct chemical balance of a brain is. So how could you test an imbalance when there is no standard to test it against? Okay. That's, right? it, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize that there was, there was first off no test and also no standard that, yeah. that exists. So yeah. How can you address a problem that there's no standard for? So like, how, it's basically you... fraud, but it, that's what passes for mental health. <laughs> wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so uh, in in talking about this approach in, in the Dianetics, uh, you know, approach, um, what is it that, like, so the patient comes in and they're, they're working with you. What is it that that approach does that's maybe different from traditional, uh, you know, therapy options? Okay. Well, the first thing, the first concept to convey is, so in Dianetics, um, Aaron Hubbard talks about a concept called the reactive mind. And this is different than, so if you think about it, in the traditional model in psychology, people think of a conscious and unconscious mind, right? There's that model. But in that model, they think of the unconscious mind as being something that's like, it's supposed to be there and it's just everything that rides underneath the surface and it's, you know, it's just your normal, natural part of yourself. That is not really accurate. Um, in Dianetics, it gives a model that is much more useful and works so much better. So you have, for the conscious mind, we refer to as the analytical mind. Okay, that concept is very similar. Okay, conscious mind, what you're using to figure out, solve problems in your life and, you know, your, your basic normal memories and everything along those lines. Sure. The reactive mind is just essentially the repository for all of your pain. Okay, and that pain has two types. It's physical pain and it's emotional pain. And sometimes you got instances, obviously, that have both, but that's basically all it is. Physical pain, you know, it's times where you got physically hurt and then emotional pain, which I don't think I have to describe, but, but that, that basic idea. Now, when you have a significant painful incident, it, like I said, it could be physical. Like for example, it could be, and we would even include something like a surgery. Like if you get a surgery, sure. you're, you know, a drug is used on you to like, which is essentially a poison that forces you unconscious. You then have various physical actions done to you that cut you or technically. And then even though the surgery might be you know, has a purpose to fix something, it itself is still a painful incident. That's right. in that react point. So it could be a physical incident or it could be an emotional one. Like someone walks in and says, your mom's dead, you know, and you go through that. The, the package of that experience from, from the moment that it kind of, the pain hits you, to let's say when it tapers off and you kind of come back fully to full consciousness, so to speak, fully aware and, and normalized, that package incident we call an engram. Okay. An engram is just a word. It basically literally means a lasting trace, if you were to look at the etymology of the word. So the reactive mind is basically composed of these engrams. Now, the difference about it is that these engrams, the, the memory in them is separate from your normal memories. If I ask you to remember what you had for dinner last night, it's pretty straightforward memory. I'm assuming nothing traumatic happened there. Um, sure. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. No, we're good. <laughs> um, and and so you have the that that regular analytical memory bank, and then you have this reactive memory bank. What happens is a painful incident happens, and then an engram is stored. Now, it can either start to affect you immediately from there on out, or it can sit dormant until it's later triggered. Okay. So one example is, okay, let's say mom dies. You go through that experience. It's a big loss. The loss is weighing on you. You are now maybe, like maybe you're kind of depressed after that, or you're, you're, maybe you're not depressed, so to speak, but you are, you're energy and enthusiasm in life have been dampened in some way. Sure. You you don't have as much drive as you used to. So that's one experience. 
it happens and then it, it and then it carries on from there. Another example would be something that and this kind of gets into a lot of people who end up going on psychiatric drugs when they don't know why. Because it's one thing to say, okay, mom died, I'm depressed since then. Okay, I'm going to go to a therapist and try to get some treatment. But sometimes people go to a counselor and they don't know why they feel the way they do. They just started to feel that way at some point. That's where the that's where the smoke and mirrors of the whole chemical balance theory really gets its chance to be pushed on someone. You see what I'm saying? Because they can say, oh, yeah, it must be chemical balance since we don't know what it is. It's got to be that. Right. So, Couldn't so be anything else. Box situation, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So they really that's where most of their customers come from that way. But it's more like this. So, OK, let me take a different example. So let's say let's say someone's claustrophobic. Let's say that's their problem. Whenever they get in an elevator, uh, they can't they feel like they can't breathe and they got to get out. <clears throat> OK, where's that come from? Now, you may talk to them and ask them and say, well, when did this start? And you say, well, ever since my when I was um, 11, my brother locked me in a closet for like 10 minutes and, you know, he wouldn't let me out. And you say, okay. And, and so, so you weren't claustrophobic before that. No, no, no. It's only after that. Okay. But if you look at that experience real closely, if a Dianetics counselor looks at that experience, there was not really any pain in it. They could breathe fine in the closet. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't physically injured. Um, they were unset, unhappy being in there, but there wasn't, see, what we call, the term we use for like all of the various, you know, like the mental health industry has all these labels for everything, right? They like to make labels for things. The reason they like labels is because it goes in this book that gets a billing code and then they can use that to build the insurance company. You have to pick one of the labels with a billing code to build the insurance company. That's how it works. Sure. So, <laughs> so, but we just use a general term, which is called aberration, which basically means a departure from a straight line or to see crookedly. Any form of irrationality is basically aberration. So all of the various, because there's a there's a variety of ways people can have a problem and they could have variations on that. And that's, you don't need a name for everyone. It's just an aberration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this particular case, you would look at this experience with the, the brother in the closet or a brother locking you in the closet, and there's not enough pain in that experience to actually cause an aberration. So there's something more to it. Plus, plus, check this out. One of the clues is when you get in the elevator, you can't breathe, but you could breathe fine in the closet. Right. So the breath problem has to be coming from somewhere where, the, where it was a real problem. Okay. In other words, it comes from an incident when you actually couldn't breathe or where you were in enough pain that someone around you said something. Here's an interesting thing in Dianetics, that when you're in heavy pain, the words and phrases around you can go in as hypnotic commands. So it could also be you got hurt. You're, let's say you're not, you get hit over the head with a bat and somebody goes, oh my God, I don't think you can breathe. That can cause asthma later. It can cause things like that, okay? Really? So you okay. Either need okay. a command. You either need like a command, the thought of not being able to breathe that would cause that breath or you need the, a situation where you actually couldn't breathe in order to get that scenario when they're in the elevator and can't breathe, okay? Hmm, okay. So what this person doesn't remember in this scenario is when they were two years old, some kids locked him in an abandoned refrigerator and he almost suffocated to death. That incident happened when they were two, but then it sat dormant. They weren't claustrophobic until... They ran into the six, the brother locked him in the closet and they were tired that day. Maybe they're hungry. They weren't feeling good already. And then this happens and it was enough to trigger the reactive mind. And what the reactive mind said, the reactive mind thinks like an idiot. It thinks in identities. So okay. it says this thing is equal to that thing, which are maybe they're not related at all. They're not equal. The reactive mind says, this, I'm in the closet. I, this is just like when I was in the refrigerator. And it turns on the engram. Now it's active. Now, every time he goes in the elevator or a small space, he can't breathe. And he gets all the symptoms from the earlier incident when they were two. Hmm. This is part of the problem with you know, psychology. They don't, uh, you, you might go to a regular psychologist, regular therapist, and you'll spend all your time talking about the closet incident. Oh, I just feel this way and I feel that way and I feel that way. But they don't know that there's this other incident. That's the real problem. Sure, sure. So that's just another example of like how it's different. So in Dianetics, what we would do is we we would know, number one, 
that we didn't find the incident we're looking for yet. And we would know it when we found it. But, and there are techniques in a session that I can do to trigger that earlier incident and trigger the memory, like bring it to their, bring it to the surface. Okay. okay. And once we get a handle on that memory, a little piece of it, they say, oh, no, I'm get, getting this image of, uh, I'm getting this image of like white walls. They're really close in or something, you know? And then you can start to develop it and get through it. And then here's the, here's the amazing thing about Dianetics. Any incident that we take up in a session will be completely resolved in that one session. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter how severe it is. It doesn't matter if it's physical pain, emotional pain, anything else. In, in that session, that inc- we won't finish that session until we're done, that incident. Now, a session in Dianetics is different than other types of counseling because it's not like, uh, oh, it's 45 minutes, see you next week, you know? Sure. Uh, no, this, the, the session length is dictated by getting to a completion point on whatever we're addressing. Understood. So okay. It's, it's a session could be two hours, could be three hours, you know, could be something like that. It could be shorter than that, could be a half hour. It really depends on what you're addressing, how severe it is. And it's not just how severe it is, but also where the person's at. Because, for example, I could take, like, there's a, I can I can tell you about like a woman years ago who she, when she first came in she was so charged up emotionally about her mother that even the mildest incident would send her into grief. Mm-hmm. Just a mundane thing where mom looked at her a little you know critically you know she'd go into grief okay. But after we found some of the key emotional pain incidents that were sitting in the reactive mind and resolved them. Very shortly, she was at the point where she could look at the most severe incidents related to her mother, and it didn't cause any grief. So as you unburden things in the reactive mind, the person has more mental wherewithal to attack the rest of the reactive mind. Okay. It gets easier and easier to to handle the rest of it. Almost like... Uh, you know, going to the gym and, and exercising those muscles, and and the more you do it, the the better you get, and and you, the stronger you get, and and the easier it gets at, over time. Um, to a certain degree, like, that like like that's kind of what you're talking about, right? To a certain degree, that. But actually, um, the analogy Alan Hubbard talks about. So imagine like this: imagine you had like imagine there's this pool, this mm-hmm. reservoir of life force, okay? Like whatever your life energy, whatever you want to call that mental fortitude whatever but let's imagine it's like this pool of mental energy right all like what you're let's say and the pool represents all of the all of the power you have mental energy you have okay okay as a painful experience let's say an engram happens it traps some of that reservoir in the engram okay. you have another one happen another one happen another one happen another one happen after so when somebody comes in Okay, maybe they're at a point where half of it is embroiled in engrams and half of it's free. Okay, well, they have that other half to attack the first half. But you could have someone, let's say, who's someone who's who's schizophrenic. Well, what you're talking about there is a situation where there's like there's like 10% free. And the majority of it is all embroiled in, in painful experiences. Okay. So they only have this 10%. And when you're going to attack an experience in an incident, you have to use some of it. You're going to get a little bit interbulated, a little bit upset in the middle of the session because you have to attack it, right? And then you're going to get through it and you're going to be better at the end of it. But if you have, let's say you've got somebody, let's say someone's schizophrenic, they're overwhelmed by all the experiences. Now they've got like, let's just using arbitrary numbers, they got 10 units available, but they're going to attack an incident that's 15 units well, that incident has more power than you have to attack it. So you can't, you couldn't take someone like that and go right into a heavy incident. You would have to first attack really small ones and build up the reservoir. And so they had more wherewithal. Now, this is another huge difference between the Dianetics approach that Elrond Hubbard developed and what psychology and psychiatry do, especially psychiatry. Um, because in psychiatry, think about this, the people Psychiatry seems to operate on this basis that the worse off the person, the more drastic a treatment they do to someone, right? So if you're bad off, okay, you get some treatment. If you're really bad off, 
They're going to give you heavy drugs and dope you up. If you're really, really bad off, they're going to give you electroshock and zap your brain and cause a seizure intentionally for some weird reason, thinking that that's therapy. Okay. But what they're doing is they're going more and more severe, harder and harder on a person who can take less and less. It's the opposite of what you should do. Someone who's schizophrenic should be getting uh, good food, rest, wide open spaces, um, you know, they, they uh, you know, uh, exercises like that, like maybe physical exercise, maybe mental things that help, you know, like art, things that make them feel better and, you know, out, improve their outlook, you know, things like that that would build them up gradually, you know? Sure. And then maybe you can start to get to address some mild incidents and then you can, you know what I mean? You can go like that. But, but that's the thing is like, um, you have to build the person up. So, so that's the whole thing is like, as you free up more of that reservoir, they have more to attack the rest of it with. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that that sort of makes sense too. Um, uh, you know, just think thinking of the the way you're you're phrasing it. Like, if you have you only have ten percent, but the the thing that you're trying to attack is you know fifteen percent. You know, it, it's a bigger enemy, uh, really. You know, and you're you're not going to be able to fight it. You know, putting it in in uh, you know maybe military terms, right? It, you're not going to okay. be able to overcome that uh, that obstacle, that that enemy. Um, it's just a bigger bigger force and you need the bigger force to be able to go and attack that and, and get it. So, so yeah, exactly. smaller victories, uh, build up, uh, you know, you, you collect more mental territory, if you will. And, and then Perfect you're able analogy to go. for this podcast. Excellent. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you're, you're, you're taking the, the small wins, you're, you're attacking that small base and you're, you're now expanding your, your, uh, area of, of control and influence over it. Um, and then, then you're able to go and attack the, the bigger ones because you have that more more space, more mental clarity, maybe, or or just just being able to uh, you know have the uh, capacity to go and and attack those things. So um, yeah, I guess you know that makes sense. And obviously, it's it's hard to quantify uh, you know it put in actual numbers. I know that we're talking kind of in hypotheticals here, but you know it's hard to quantify that you know the the loss of a, a parent or a, you know, a, a close loved one or something is, is this percentage and, and something else is that percentage. Um, you know, it's probably hard to do that. Um, but you can, you can talk in relative terms and say that, you know, this big event that happened is probably a lot more than the, this other small event. And, and so let's go attack that smaller thing first. Yeah. Right. The other reason why it can be hard to quantify is because, um, and this is another concept that's uh, unique in Dianetics is there's this concept called chains. And that's that basically um, incidents can similar, a, a chain of similar incidents can lock uh -huh. into each other and cause. So if you go, let's say it's all incidents when you got hit over the head. So you're 21, you got a car accident, you, you hit your head in, in that. Then when you were 15, you were riding your bike and you went over the handlebars and you hit your head. And when you were eight, you were climbing a tree and you fell down and you hit your head. Okay. So let's say we go to sit down and address the incident, the car accident. A Dionysus counselor knows that because, because he has a technique that actually works and will resolve it, he knows when it's not responding and he knows what to look for instead. So he if I address the, the incident when I was 21, when you're 21, and it wasn't after a certain after applying certain techniques, if it wasn't reducing its its force and power as it should, I would know there's an earlier similar incident to it. And I would ask for the earlier one. And then I would get that. When I get to the earliest point that I need to on that chain, that incident will release its pain completely. And to some degree, it will also lessen the, the power and force of the later ones. Okay. Right. That, have you ever had the experience of um, you, let's say when you're young, somebody dies who you were very close with, you're very upset about it. Mm -hmm. Later, somebody dies who you aren't as close to at all, but for some reason you're more upset than the first time. Some people yeah, I think have, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Right? The re that reason that is is because the second time they're feeling the pain from both of them. Mm -hmm. They triggered the earlier incident and they're feeling this. So now it seems like it doesn't it didn't make sense. It's, it's a perfect example of aberration. It's illogical. Sure. But when you understand how the reactive mind ties into it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, because 
you know, maybe, maybe there's some, you know, unprocessed uh, grief and other issues that maybe you, you were dealing with from that first one um, that you are just hanging on to and you, you just learn to live with maybe. And then, uh, you know, this, this other uh, event happens and, um, and then now it's like, okay, now all of it's coming out and, and it's like all coming out in, in full force. Um, you know, you, you take maybe the mild form of, of grief that you might've had for this, this other person that you, you know, weren't maybe as close to. Um, and then you combine that with whatever you stored away from that original person that you just sort of learned to live with the, the pain and, and the, the guilt maybe, or, or whatever it is that's associated with it, that you, that you stored away, uh, somewhere. And then, then it's, it's coming out with its, with its friends now, <laughs> you know, it, 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 they're all coming out together. Right. Um, yeah, I can see how that, that, that happens. Um, and so by addressing that original or, or the, earlier um incident um kind of helps to reduce the the impact of the the future ones um you know however many there there may have been like you're you're talking to you know getting hit in the head several times throughout your life um you know you have to kind of work on on the first one and then then you can start to see the benefits in in the later ones as well right yeah and and not only that but another really unique thing about Dynex is you can also directly address psychosomatic illnesses with it. Uh, if people aren't familiar with the term, psycho means having to do with the mind, somatic having to do with the body. So it means the mind making the body ill. Sure. A lot sure. of people mistakenly think psychosomatic means it's imaginary. No, it doesn't. It actually can physically manifest and still be psychosomatic. Okay. It just means that it's coming from an engram where, where an injury happened to that area. With Dynex, you can actually directly address and resolve those types of things too. Mm. Perfect example is um, I had a woman recently and she had been experiencing, she would get these headaches. Once in a while she'd get these headaches and they were really peculiar because they were only in the back of the head. Um, so after doing a little bit of looking, we found that it went back to this experience where she was in the bathroom as a child, like six years old, um, doing for whatever reason, doing like this kind of like a, like trust falls with her grandfather. Like she was falling back and he would catch her and he wasn't paying attention. She fell back and hit her head right on the tile. Oh, wow. And you know, it was very dramatic, but that incident was the reason why now in her late forties, she so suddenly started to get develop headaches. Now, who would know other than the Dianus Gazer to connect those two things and find them? Because as soon as we addressed the incident, they were gone. You know, Interesting. Yeah. Pretty, pretty amazing. It is. Um, and, you know, I, I think as, as you're talking about this, there's a lot of things. Initially, I, I was my thought was, you know, the, the PTSD and, and other traumatic events that people experience, are, those tend to be the emotional, um, you know, issues. But people also uh, may have physical uh, issues that come along with those traumatic events as well. Um, you know, talking about veterans and uh you know maybe they were involved in a you know an ied explosion uh, type of scenario which certainly is a traumatic event um and but they may have also been injured in that explosion and and so not only they're, they're kind of carrying doing double duty there they're carrying the pain the physical pain of whatever happened to them but they're also carrying the the mental emotional side of things because of of that traumatic event and so now, now you have kind of two things that you're dealing with, but they came from the same event. Um, and so that, that initially was my, my, my thought here, but we're, we're, we can be going back to, you know, all sorts of different things, um, going, you know, back to, I mean, you're just a little, little kid, right? Oh yeah. It not actually it goes back even further than that. You in Dianetics, he actually, um, was one of the first times anyone discussed prenatal memories that those memories actually are also accessible. Okay. You can, you can actually completely remember incidents that happened in the womb and none of that, but some of them are actually having an effect on you now physically. Interesting. It, it, it might seem weird and crazy, but it's, it really works. It's, 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 it's kind of wild. Like I've, I've walked many people through their own births um, wow. and, or through prenatal incidents. You think about like 
mom's pregnant with you. She runs into the table. You get, you know, jostled around. Your head hurts. You know, there's, you know, this type of thing. And that that can cause a problem later, potentially. Mm -hmm. But these things are actually accessible. You can you can find them, you know, and you know, using Dianetics. Um, oh, one thing when I mentioned earlier how like a freeze in an incident can cause it actually can affect um, it very much can also apply to the um, physical pain. Uh, a friend of mine years ago, she was in a bar and someone took a glass and smashed it in her face. And um, it was mostly a flesh wound as far as the doctor was concerned. He had to do stitches, but it, everything else seemed like it was fine. But she started to get these headaches and she had them every night. And it, they were bad enough. She started taking Percocets to go to sleep. Hmm. And this is a person who doesn't like to take aspirin, but that's how bad right. it was. Right. So it was maybe three or four weeks later. I'm like, why don't you come in? Let me give you a session. So when we started, she couldn't remember any of it. Like she can remember walking into the bar, you know, everything, what happened up to it. But she didn't remember the middle. So in Dianetics, we have the person, they close their eyes. There's no hypnosis or anything like that used. In fact, hypnosis is not good for you. Um, we don't want to make people suggest we want to wake them up. Mm -hmm. So, but the person goes through the experience. At, they try to go through it as if it's happening now, you know, re-experience it that way. And we do it repetitively, but there's very specific things that you get the person to focus on where the pain is stored, okay? okay. And if you get them to do that, it will unlock the pain. It's almost like if you think about the whole incident, it's like a tarp that's laying over the person. And imagine there's just a couple, is like three or four nails that are holding this tarp down. And you're trying to pull the tarp and you can't get it off. But if you knew what the nails, you knew where the nails were, and you knew how to just get those out, the rest of it would just fall apart. That's the that's the value of Dianetics. Okay. Right? We can write to those things, can remove those things, and the thing falls apart, like in a good way. Sure. So in her case, when we got down to it, here's what the headaches were caused by. Obviously, part of it was it goes impact, shatter, right? So the impact is a headache. But that wouldn't have caused the headaches every night. The extra element was, and this was only uncovered after going through the incident, like getting to the bottom of it. Right after she got hit, some guy in the bar yells, damn, that must hurt. Uh -huh. Now, the reactive mind I mentioned before thinks idiotically. It thinks in that it, it takes things literally, for example. So mm -hmm. he said, he was saying, damn, that must hurt. I bet that hurts, right? Yes. The reactive mind hears those words and takes it literally. That has to hurt. It must hurt now. Right. So the reactive mind, that phrase, after she found that phrase and desensitized it, headaches were gone. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So tell us now a little bit about the uh, Restored Valor Project and, and the work that you do, uh, you know, with that and, and uh, you know, how you're, how you're helping folks out through, uh, through that. Yeah, so the, the model for um, how we operate with Restored Valor is any, if there's any veteran who feels that they have something they want to address from their time in service, you know, like some trauma, or it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like a, a combat trauma. It could be, you know, the loss, they lost their buddy, you know, uh, you know, like they, their, their, their friend was over there and they died and they're stuck in that or, you know, it, these types of experiences can be sometimes you witness something sometimes sometimes they you know they did something that's really affecting them or sometimes they saw something happen to someone else and that really mm -hmm. affected them any variety of that but something that happened during their time in their service they can um they can reach out and the first thing i'll do is make sure okay i want to make sure they're not on any current like psychiatric drugs or anything like that if they are mm -hmm. I would point them to certain resources. Like, for example, um, there's a website, cchr.org, which stands for Citizens Commission on Human Rights. There's a number of documentaries that they have on there that really will educate the person about the kind of things I was telling you about psychiatry and stuff like that. Because a lot of it, the first person has got to realize that they're being harmed by this other treatment. Okay. The next thing is they'll need to get, you know, if, like I said, if they're on those medications, they'll need to get um, proper assistance from a doctor to how, how to wean properly. Mm -hmm. that's not something I do. It's a doctor would do that. Um, anyway, let's assume they're not on that, but they're interested. The first thing I would have them do is I'm watch the Dianetics video. It's about an hour and a half. I have it right on the website. 
Uh, it's set up like a YouTube playlist. So it's like set up as 15 chapters, you know, 15 short videos that play after that. That's an hour and a half. If anybody wants to go to it directly, they can go to happymind.watch and they can watch that video. Okay. So once a person watches the video, they will then understand a lot of these things I was telling you about Dianetics. It gives a really, it's really well produced, it explains all about the reactive mind, gives lots of examples. It even gives the basic structure of how a session works. It doesn't get into all the nitty gritty details and additional tools inside that session structure that I can use, but it gives you the basic structure of how a session works. So after they see that, I say, okay, good. Is this, do you want to do that? And they say, yes, good. Then the next thing I would do is I would, okay, so I don't know where they're at. So let's say they're in, you know, let's say they're in Texas. Okay. So my next job is to locate a Dianetics counselor near them. Okay. And once I do, the charity will pay the counselor to do the session, to do the sessions on that person to resolve the, what they're what they've been hanging you know what's been that they've been carrying from their military service okay okay the the purpose of the service of it we're not going to try to tackle their whole life and everything like that with with uh, within the confines of what we do in the charity we're here to, to handle the military stuff after that if they want to do more with dynamics we obviously they can they could hire that counselor as a personal you know as a counselor sure. if they want to do other things in their life but we're trying to just clean up the military service that's the purpose Got of it. the charity right yeah and that um sense. but that's basically it there's no cost to the veteran um, we're just here to help them resolve these things and show these things are solvable. Mm -hmm. There is a secondary thing I'll also say. Uh, a secondary service that um, I can do, maybe for organizations, like if they want to have me come out, fly me out, that kind of thing. One of the really cool things about Dianetics is that, okay, there's doing it at a professional level like myself. Mm -hmm. I have all the bells and whistles at my disposal. but you can actually use Dianetics with its basic session structure at a novice level, peer to peer. Okay. Okay. I can do a seminar on a room full of people where it's like a weekend seminar. They go, we go through the video, but we also go through examples and everything like that. And then what happens is everybody pairs up and they have, they have like a, a little thing that has the, the steps of the procedure. And then, okay supervised they can do sessions on each other oh interesting right that's another that's just another alternative and and like i said it's not it obviously it's you have more tools at your disposal when you're a professional but you can get so much benefit just even from the basic structure and so sometimes people that might be appealing to them like there might be a group and they want to learn that to help each other do peer-to-peer -peer type stuff and that's okay too well that's awesome and and i'm i'm Glad that you offer this resource to uh, to folks, to, to veterans, um, you know, especially, you know, with the context of this show. Um, you know, one of the things that we do on this show is uh, highlight organizations like yours that provide uh, alternatives to the traditional uh, therapies options that are available. Um, you, you mentioned some things like, um, you know, sometimes artwork or, or painting or something, it, it might be just the thing that someone needs to kind of calm, calm their mind. And, you know, so we talk about things, you know, all sorts of alternatives um, because, uh, you know, some people may feel more comfortable with one than another. And, and the whole point is, you know, keep trying something till you find that thing that works. And, and maybe, you know, maybe it's Dianetics. Maybe that's the thing that works for you that you feel comfortable with and that you want to do. And so I'm, I'm happy to uh, be able to, introduce this organization to uh you know my listeners because i want i want people to have all the tools and all the resources available to them uh you know at their disposal so that they they know um you know that there is still an option that that they don't have to um you know make any kind of permanent uh you know decisions like like uh, suicide or, or something like that because they don't right. see any other option and so you know the more options we have available um the way i see it is that just means hey i tried this other thing it didn't work check it off the list move on to the next thing and so you know i'm, I'm really glad that you're first off that you're doing what you're doing um and also that we're able to uh you know help highlight it to the listeners and and hopefully um, you know, it's something that that somebody decides. You know, hey, the, I, I've I've tried a couple other things, maybe, or or maybe I'm just trying to figure it out just from the start right now, and I I, I need to 
do something. And, and so, yeah, give it a shot. Um, you know, and like you Absolutely. said, there's no, no cost to the veteran, um, to, to go through, you know, some of their military issues. Um, and, and so, you know, you really don't have anything to lose. It's not like you're, you're, um, you know, going in for a surgery that might be risky or, or something like that. It, the, it's a pretty low risk, uh, type of situation. And, and so, um, you know, the way I, I see it is, you know, why not give it a try? If you, if you feel like all hope is lost, give, give something a try and, and do something. Um, you know, the, uh, there's, there's a saying, um, the best thing that you can do is the right thing. Uh, the second best thing that you could do is the wrong thing. And the, the worst thing that you could do is nothing. And so like, get out there and try, try different things. And, and I'm, I'm super glad that you were able to come on the show and, and share what you do and what your organization does uh, to, to help the, the veterans um, because that, that just gives them uh, one more, one more option in their, their toolkit that they, they're able to use uh, in, in their journey, you know? So um, anything else that you'd like to share? Any, any other websites? I know I'll, I'll have the, the CCHR, uh, dot org and, and happy mind dot watch uh, that you mentioned. Uh, I'll put those in the show notes. Any other uh, websites or any, any well, other ways that people can get in touch? Well, the charity website is restoredvalor.org. And um, obviously, you know, in order to do this kind of work, uh, you know, anyone who, out there who's interested in donating for this type of work it will help to uh, make it available for veterans. So, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I'm assuming donation uh, information is on the website as well yep. and, and people can find that there. So, yeah, definitely. If, uh, you know, this is not something that you uh, you know are in need of for yourself, but you're looking to help somebody out, uh, you know, definitely consider making a donation. I'll have a link to the, to all of those websites that we talked about in the show. I'll have that on the website uh, and in the show notes. So you can you can find all those links there. Um, but but Chris, thank you again for all the work that you're doing and for taking the time to come on. Um, I, I think um, your uh, your work uh, to kind of challenge the the status quo in in the mental health industry is uh, is going to be helpful uh, for for some folks, and uh, we'll we'll hopefully get them the the relief and the the help that they need. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. You bet. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to support the show, please check out Scott's book, Surviving Son, on Amazon. All of the sales from that book go directly back into this podcast and work to help veterans in need. You can also follow the Drive On Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. 